Hello everyone and welcome back to part 2 of sewing the 1840s Jane Eyre inspired dress. Last time we left off with the completion of the bodice. If you have not seen that video and would like to, it is linked down in the description box and will also be linked at the end of this video. In this video I will be completing the skirt and doing all those little finishing touches. The Truly Victorian Pattern TV 454 1845 German Day Dress does not actually have physical pattern pieces for the skirt. Instead, they provide instructions for drafting the skirt yourself. That requires taking a lot of measurements, and I am very thankful that I have a dress form to do this. I made sure to take the measurements for the skirt length over the petticoats that I was going to be wearing under the dress once it is completed. After taking all of those measurements of the how long the waist is, how long is the waist to the floor, how long is that to where I wanted the skirt to be hemmed, um, all those good measurements, I then did some calculations and began drafting the pattern onto the fabric for the skirt. The panels for the skirt are a lot shorter in length than I'm used to because the waistline of this bodice is so much lower. The waistline really isn't at the natural waistline at all, but rather it it goes to the hips, which is different than a lot of the other historical costuming that I've done, which really centers around the natural waistline. The waistline of this dress is also not even, which is which is different than than things I have done in the past. Uh, so therefore, the top of the skirt panels are also not cut evenly, uh, there is a dip. Because since there is a dip in the center of the bodice, there needs to be a dip in the front of the center, the center front skirt panel. And, and no, I know there's someone out there that is bothered that I did not iron the fabric for my skirt, but I could not be bothered to do that. So, here we are with some wrinkly fabric. I then pinned the skirt panels that I had cut out together and I sewed them using my machine. And yay! I remembered to put the pins in the right way this time! Usually I... I don't. <laughs> I ironed my skirt fabric and pressed the seams of the skirt flat and oh, it is so satisfying to watch.
it was then time to begin the waist treatment for the skirt, and I decided to do cartridge pleats, which I have never done before, and only have a vague idea of how to do. Thankfully, the internet can be a wonderful place, and there is a absolutely amazing article about how to sew cartridge pleats on historicalsewing.com, which I followed and have linked down in the description box if you are interested in a much more precise description of how to do cartridge pleating than I am going to give in this video. Cartridge pleating is a method of gathering large amounts of fabric into a small waistband, or sometimes on a shoulder arm cycle, without adding bulk to the seam. It's pretty magical. It also makes the fabric spring away from the waist or the shoulder more than just, you know, normal box pleating or knife pleating, or the other way of gathering does. Cartridge pleats have to be done by hand, and they are quite time consuming. Cartridge pleats were popular throughout history, but in the Victorian era, they were popular from the 1830s to 1860s, and then they went out of favor when the new mass produced assembly line garments took over. The first step in doing a cartridge pleat is folding down the top of the fabric, because you're going to be sewing along that kind of like a top hem uh, a little bit. Uh, anyway, you need to take into account that you are going to need more fabric or more length to the fabric when you are doing a cartridge pleat. So you have to take that into consideration when you are doing your measurements for the skirt, if you are drafting your own pattern, which you have to do if you are using the truly Victorian pattern that I am. You, it depends, you can fold down the fabric. Uh, I don't think there's like an exact amount that you have to do, except like it has to fit all of your, your stitches. So I'm just doing two inches. Once you turn down the fabric, you then have to use a basting stitch along the top edge of the skirt. But you don't want to put these stitches at their right to be top. You want to do it about one fourth of an inch down from the very top. The spaces between stitches uh, can vary on how full you want the pleats um, and how bulky your fabric is. I experimented a little with how full I wanted the pleats to be and I, I came to the conclusion that I wanted them this full. Cartridge pleats consist of two and sometimes more uniform hand basting stitches. I'm just doing two, which is like the bare minimum. So you have to make sure that these two rows of stitching match up exactly. Most people would mark where they want these stitches to go so that they can make sure they are exact. But since I have stripes on my fabric, I was able to just count the stripes to make sure the basting stitches were in the same place and in the same length. You then pull the ends of the thread to gather the cartridge pleats. You want to make sure that you're using good, strong thread because you do not want these to break because that just means, oh, I wouldn't even want to think of that. You just spent all that time doing all those basting stitches and lining things up so exactly, it, I would be heartbroken if my thread broke. So anyway, make sure you use good strong thread, as I did here. But pulling these things together with your nice strong thread is so satisfying to watch. You know, we've had a lot of really satisfying sewing moments in this video. It was then time to attach the cartridge pleats to the bodice. I had to get the pleats sorted so that they were the perfect spacing um, and to fit to the bodice.
and then pin the bodice to the skirt. To attach cartridge pleats, you put a whip stitch in the middle of the cartridge pleat. Actually, you put two whip stitches in the middle of the cartridge pleat you d because you don't want this to come undone. You want to do that second stitch so it's really nice and secure. Whip stitches are one of my favorite stitches because they are so fast and so easy to do. It was then time to create the back seam, so I pinned the edges of the skirt together so that they actually came together uh, in the back, and then I sewed them down with my machine. For back closures, I decided to do hook and eye tape. I really love hook and eye tape. Uh, it's fantastic. I love it so much. So easy. I then pinned that down and I sewed it with my machine. The next thing I did was stitch down the hem, and the dress was done. I'm not sure when I'll be able to do a really nice photo shoot with this dress, uh, because I would love to do it at an a nice location and I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to get to do that but when I do because I will at some point I will also do a costume spotlight video so y'all can see this dress on and see how it moves because I think that's one of the the really beautiful things of getting to do costuming like this is just seeing how the fabric moves and of course I would love to do this uh, costume spotlight video photo shoot in the Jane Eyre theme, which is just this glorious gothic 
uh, is a very nice aesthetic, if you ask me. I, I do enjoy the gothic. Uh, but we shall see. We shall see what I am able to make happen. But stay tuned, because something will be happening. And always, thank you so much for watching.